Hey, we are in the middle of what we call the Advent Conspiracy, and it's just our attempt to kind of reframe Christmas. Now, we're 10 days out, okay? So it, it started like back in September, you know, the, the trees and the ornaments started showing up at Lowe's, and you're like, already? And, and, but when you're 10 days out, I mean, it's on us, right? Like you can start feeling the stress and the, and the you know, even the drive by the, when you go by the shopping areas, you're like, oh, really, here we go. And the chaos is, is upon us, okay? And so we started with the Advent Conspiracy talking about, you know, really the whole purpose is to worship fully, to be fully present to, to the Lord and, and put our attention there. Uh, and then Chili did a great job last week. Hey, how about that, Chili? Y'all get to, yeah, right? So he's no longer the best kept secret. We're, we're letting him out, so y'all watch out. He's awesome. Um, he did a great job of talking about spending less because, you know, the truth is that the average American will, will go into $1,000 of credit card debt just this month, All right? They're already 9000 on average in debt, and so they're just going to tack on a whopping thousand more dollars because of Christmas, and it'll take them over two months to pay that off. So he talked about spending less and, and not being about things, and uh, this week I'm going to talk about giving more. No, I'm not contradicting what Chili preached on last week. Um, but what we're talking about is giving, not necessarily things, not necessarily a, a purchase. Now, it could be, but really we're going to talk about the heart of the gospel here when it comes to Christmas. If you think about the incarnation, and Jesus came from heaven in really what was a counterinsurgency. All right, God had created, Satan came in, ruined it. And now Jesus is saying, I'm taking it back, all right? So God sends his only son. Um, he sends him to be with us, sends him in the flesh to be one of us so that he could get close to us to explain the kingdom of God. And so Jesus, all throughout the Gospels, it says the kingdom is like. The kingdom of heaven is like. What can I compare the kingdom of heaven to? And he starts explaining it to people so they can grasp an understanding of what God has come and intended to do. And he came, and then he laid down his life to pay the price for our sins so that we could be brought back into relationship with God the Father. And so this counterinsurgency is really about him coming to make himself known so that we could be aware of what he has to offer, and then paying the price or giving the gift that we really desperately needed. All right, so when we talk about celebrating Christmas and giving gifts, a couple things. One, proximity. Two is presence. Three is meeting a real need. So when I say give more, I'm talking about it may just be proximity. What do you mean by proximity? I mean Getting close enough in someone's life so that they know that you know them. They know that you see them. Presence, being near. Could be an experience. It could be, hey, I'm not going to give you a gift. I'm going to take you on a walk. What? <laughs> that doesn't sound great. Well, think through it a little bit. Here's the thing. To give the right kind of gift, all right, one that... Um, has proximity, one that has um, presence, one that meets a meaningful need. This requires something we are often less able to access in our own hearts and minds. We have to make time to produce the words that are thoughtful and caring. We have to take time to think about an e event or uh, um, an experience like a walk that would be meaningful. We have to take time to think about the person and what is their real need. It could be just affirmation. It could just be um, remembrance. And so that is harder for us than simply going out and buying a trinket. What's the gift you're most excited about giving this Christmas? You know, oftentimes um, it's not the... I was looking at the top 10 gifts. One of them is the, um, the cooker pot. Not, not a crock pot, but the, yeah, 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 that one. And like, everyone wants this, this pot that makes food fast. 
And I'm like, okay, how exciting is that? You know, and, and, and it was a fad. It's the fad this year. 20 years ago is the bread machine. How many of you ladies got a bread machine 20 years ago that you still never use? Awesome. Yeah. And so we go through these fads, and, and everyone's excited about a certain thing, or all the kids want these, uh, the, the uh, flying dro drones. They want a drone. Well, okay, that's really cool until about the second day when they crash that thing into the building, and then it's over, right? And so we all know how it goes. What is the gift that we can give that is meaningful, that is presence, that is proximity, that will last? We're going to be looking at a story in Matthew chapter 7. And it's not a Christmas story per se, but it does have a lot to do with giving. In Matthew 7, Jesus has just finished his Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7 are all about the Sermon on the Mount. And this is where Jesus comes to say, this is the kingdom of God. This is what the kingdom of God looks like. This is, the people who are kingdom people have these, this kind of heart. They have this kind of attribute. And then at the end of this, it says John the Baptist and his, um, some of his followers came. And the Pharisees and then the, the um, tax collectors and the prostitutes, okay? There's two very different groups. There's John the Baptist. Then there's the, the sinners. And then there's the religious people. There's this little dialogue that takes place, and in verse 28 it says, Jesus says this, I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. The one who is, yet, the one who is least in the kingdom of God, here he is talking about the kingdom of God, the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. He says there's no one greater than John, but the least in the kingdom of God. This is his message, the kingdom of God is, is, is prime, primary and this is what the incarnation is about. This is what Christmas is about. That Jesus came to usher in his kingdom and make this available. And he says the least person in the kingdom of God is greater than the greatest John. All the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, they said, uh-huh, that's right. Mm-hmm. Why? Because they had been baptized with John's baptism. And they're like, yep, John's my man. And then the Pharisees went, uh-uh, no, that's not true. Why? Because they hadn't been baptized with John's baptism. But the Pharisees, the experts in the law, rejected, and look how it says this, rejected God's purpose for themselves. This, what Jesus came to offer, the kingdom of God, is the very purpose of our lives and the Pharisees rejected it because they didn't want to side with John the Baptist. So Jesus goes on to say, what can I compare the people of this generation? They're like children sitting in the marketplace. We played the pipe for you, and you did not dance. We sing a dirge, and you did not cry. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and yet you said he had a demon. You said he had a demon because he didn't eat bread or drink wine. The Son of Man comes, and he drinks wine and eats bread. He's friends with tax collectors and sinners. And so you say he's a drunkard and a glutton. And Jesus is basically saying, can't win here. I see what you're doing, and there's no winning side. So here's the thing. They accept or reject the kingdom truth based on what they've already decided. Now, we're going to apply this to giving, but before we do that, Jesus transitions, and he tells this story butted up against this truth. Then one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. Context, all right? He just got finished saying, I can't win with the Pharisees. They have nothing to do with the kingdom of God. They've rejected it, even though it's their purpose and they want me to be, if, if I'm like John the Baptist and I, I don't drink, then I'm a demon. And if I drink and eat and associate, then I'm a glutton. Can't win with these guys. Very next scene. A Pharisee invites Jesus to his house. This is important. When he goes, he reclines at the table. Now, a woman in that town who had lived a sinful life. This is euphemism for a prostitute. Okay, or um, woman who got around, okay, 
She learned that Jesus was sitting at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. And she stood behind him at his feet, so stood behind him at his feet. He's sitting down, she's standing behind him, yet she's at his feet. How does that work? You ever think about that? All right, well, in the New Testament, um, a lot of homes, they would have a raised platform, and the tables were like coffee tables. They would be down like this, and you would sit with pillows, and your feet would be behind you. I'm not going to pull a hammy here. I'm trying not to. Okay. <laughs> um, and so she's standing back here at his feet, right? This was the custom. And so they would eat with one hand, you know. Anyway, that's pretty exciting. <laughs> All right, so she's standing there, and she is washing his feet with her tears. Don't miss the intensity of this. Here is a woman, a sinful woman, a known adulterer or prostitute who has gone into the home of someone that she knows despises her. And she's walked in, she's interrupted the dinner party, and with sobs, enough tears to wet his feet, is now washing the feet of Jesus and drying his feet with her hair. And then she takes perfume and she anoints his feet with oil. This is, this is really intense. Then the Pharisee says to himself, I love this. The Pharisee says to himself, now he either said it like this, if he knew what kind of woman was doing this, he wouldn't allow her to do it. Or he just thought it in his head. We don't know, but either way, it's basically saying no one else heard this except himself. He says to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is. She's a sinner. A rabbi would be unclean if a woman of, as a, of an adulterer touched him. He would have to go through ritual cleansing to be made right. Jesus answered him. He didn't even say anything. I love this. And Jesus answered him. He's thinking to himself, man, if this guy were a prophet, and Jesus is like, I'll show you prophet. Bam, I know what you're thinking. All right? He says, Simon, I want to tell you something. There was a certain money lender who had two people owe him money. One guy owed him $500. The other guy owed him $50. Yet he forgives them both. Which one do you think? Which one do you think is going to be more grateful? And Pharisee goes, Well, I, I guess the guy that owed him 500, whoever owed him more, is going to be more grateful. And Jesus says, Exactly. He who has been forgiven much loves much. Simon, since the time I walked into your home, you did not offer me the customary access to your bathroom. All right, I'm making it, I'm, I'm modernizing it because we don't understand the washing of feet, right? That's not something we do. But they walked dirt streets in sandals, and when you would get to someone's home, it was customary for them to wash their feet. That was just a common courtesy. It'd be like someone saying, hey, can I use your restroom? And you're going, uh-uh. No, you should have gone before you got here. All right? I mean, this is extremely rude. He says, when I got here, you did not offer me a kiss. All right, let's update it to our, our culture. We've got to understand this. When Jesus got there, the door opened up and Jesus went, hey, how's it going? And Simon went, didn't shake his hand. That was just a common greeting of the day. We do high five, handshake, whatever. They did a Euro air kiss thing. All right? He says, you didn't offer me the kiss. And then for guests, you would also offer them oil for their head and beard. And he says, you didn't offer me any of these customary courtesies. And yet this woman, since I, she walked in here, she has washed my feet with her tears. She has not stopped kissing my feet. And she's anointed me with oil. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. Whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Whoever forgiven much loves much. Your sins are forgiven, he tells her. 
the other guests begin to say to themselves, who is this who can forgive sins? He says to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I want to show you the three different givers. First, there is the distant host. Simon the Pharisee, he invites the rabbi to come to his house. This seems like a generous um, deal, right? Like, hey, this is an, an overture that's, that's very generous. And yet his motives are not to be generous. He doesn't give him water for his feet. He doesn't give him oil for his beard. He does not give him a greeting of a kiss. He just wants to be seen with him. He wants to have the rabbi in his home. We already know that he doesn't trust the rabbi or believe the rabbi's teaching because the preceding verse tells us what the Pharisees thought. So he's the distant host. He, he wants perceived proximity. He wants the rabbi, the famous guy, to come sit in his home, but he does not want to be close to him. And when we apply this to Christmas, I want you to think about some of the gifts that because of culture, we end up giving. We feel the obligation to go down this long list and get somebody something, even if it's insignificant or a trifle, because we want them to know we were thinking of them. All right, think about it. Like, you'll get a fruitcake, and you're like, okay, we can give this. And you'll re-gift that fruitcake to somebody else because you don't want it. And you know they don't want it, but you want them to know that you were thinking of them, just like the person that gave it to you wanted you to know that they were thinking of them. It doesn't mean anything, but it's the thought that counts. Well, if the thought counts, what kind of thought is it? Think about it. How much more, how much more meaningful would just a handwritten note that says, hey, it's Christmas time, and I just wanted you to know what a significant friend you are to me. Merry Christmas. That right there will be remembered and be cherished when the fruitcake says, you didn't really think of me, you just re-gifted to me because you wanted me to know that I was on a list. Am I right? I know some of you don't like that, but we all do it. I'm not saying I don't. Why? Because our culture demands it. And yet we can get off that treadmill and actually give proximity versus the charade of false proximity. The second giver is the desperate giver. This is the persistent proximity of someone who is so grateful that they will not be denied. She storms into the house where she's not wanted. She's reviled as a slut. She throws herself at her feet and she washes his feet with her tears. And she pours out the perfume on his body. And we don't know if it was her dowry perfume. People, theologians make all kinds of stuff about it. It wouldn't have mattered what it was. It could have been a little vial of olive oil off the top of her kitchen. And that that was all she had, she still would have grabbed it and gone. Because she just needed a token of expression to say, Oh, I'm so grateful. You mean so much to me. But the token without the sentiment conveyed is just a fruitcake. She storms in it, and she throws her gratitude because he who has been forgiven much loves much. Who in your life needs for you to say, I see you? And I want to convey to your heart, my heart. This uncontrollable gratitude is intimate and it's sloppy, but expresses generosity, even if it's just a token possession alongside of it. It says, this is of value to me, and I want you to have it. I had brought my dad a gift, and um, he got so excited. He goes, oh, thank you, son. He goes, come in here, come in here. He's at this age now where he, he gets a little sensitive about stuff, gets emotional, and then he wants to just give you everything he has. So like, come in, my, come in here. Pick, pick one of my books. Which one do you want? I'm like, Dad, I don't need any of your books. He goes, well, you're going to get them all anyway when I die. But I want, what, is there something in here? Something in here you want? And I'm like, Dad, no, I don't. 
well, you want one of my guns? I got, I got extra, extra guns you can have. I'm like, Dad, Dad, Dad. He said, well, I want, I'll give you something. I said, Dad, you've already given me everything. I said, the things that you want me to cherish, I probably won't. But there are things that you don't know that I cherish. Like I have his Ryrie study Bible that I do my quiet time out of. And it's got little handwritten notes in there. You, I, I would fight you for that. The house was on fire, I'd grab that. There are things in this life that we can convey to people. There's so much more than a trifle on a shelf. But it takes time. It takes thoughtfulness. It takes proximity and presence for us to go, I see you. I know you. And I want to convey from my heart to your heart. It doesn't have to be very much. I remember, uh, Joe, did I used to roll out the uh, salt dough ornaments? And you can go online and get a, a, a recipe, and it's just water and flour and salt, and you mash it all up, you roll it out, and then you make them into shapes, and then you bake them, and then you paint them, and they, they, they're ornaments. My mom, every year, hangs her little Gulf oil sign that I made her because her daddy was a pipeliner for Gulf for 50 years. And she hangs that other tree in like this prominent place. And it means something to her. And it costs me nothing. So I see you and I know what's important to you. This is what it means to give more. To find out where people are and out of a heart of gratitude, express to them a heartfelt sentiment and truth. I want to express my heart to you. Last weekend I was in Bider, Texas, and I had so much gratitude poured out to Grace Point. We have uh, helped a church in Bider, both during Harvey and then in Irma. Everyone knew about Harvey, and so we sent teams down there to muck houses and resheet rock. Irma came along this year, and it was as bad as Harvey, and as many people were flooded out as Harvey, it just got no media and no press. And we were one of the only communities to reach out to them and to give generously. And they're now rebuilding again because of your generosity, because we say, hey, we see you. Even the rest of the world didn't notice, didn't make the news cycle this time. We noticed. And just gratitude. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Grace Pointers. That's what they were saying for me to tell you. It's those little simple things that we can do. It didn't take much time, much energy, much effort on our part. It made a profound difference in theirs. One guy is still rebuilding his house from Harvey. He lacks tile and a wood floor and paint and cabinets. He had a house payment. His house got ruined. He didn't have flood insurance, and so he's been building it a little bit at a time. This was five years ago. And he's still not in his house. Little things. Maybe one of you is a painter. Maybe one of you knows how to lay tile. Maybe one of you knows how to build cabinets. That's a need that can be met that's profound. The final person in this scene is the gracious ultimate giver who's Jesus. Jesus is received graciously and he receives graciously. Even though he knows the Pharisees' agenda is duplicious, he still says, yes, I'll go and I'll eat with you. And then when the woman of ill reputation comes in, he receives her and allows her to minister because he's just gracious that way. And he came to be with us so that we could know and be received. And then he gives to us what only he can give, a need that only he can meet. Your sins are forgiven. There are people in this room right now that feel like they cannot be forgiven. That what they've done is too bad, too wrong. You just don't understand, Pastor Jeff. Yeah, I do. And Jesus looks at you and he says, I look at you with compassion and love. And I came to give my life for you. I came that no matter what you've done, you can be forgiven and be brought back into the kingdom and to know your purpose and be fulfilled. And this is the good news of Christ Christmas. It's the coming of the kingdom of God. 
that Jesus came to be near to give. For God so loved the world he gave. And when we give, we should give not just to check a box and to fill a list. We should give to communicate, I see your heart. I see your need. I want to express my heart to yours. It's true that the greatest gifts can't be purchased. And Jesus, the life that he comes to offer can only be received, and he says it's received by faith. And there are people here today that have not received the life of Christ because they don't feel like they're good enough. And Jesus says, no, no, you don't understand. The person who's forgiven the most ends up loving it the most. You got it all wrong. If you think you're too wicked and too far gone to be loved by Jesus, Jesus is like, no, 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 you're my perfect candidate because you're going to love the most when you receive the love and the grace that I have for you. And he says, so what I need you to do is I need you to accept what I did on the cross. And I need you to, to give me your life and re- so that you can receive my life, so that you can now be a part of the kingdom of God and know this forgiveness. I came to draw near to you, so now you draw near to me. The scripture says that you do that by faith. How do I do that, Pastor Jeff? He says you do it by faith. You say, look, I'm done living my life. I want this grace and I want this forgiveness. And so, God, I give it to you by faith. I say, right now, my life belongs to you. I want to receive your spirit. I want to live in your kingdom. I want to know my purpose. I want to be made new. That's why Jesus came. Others of you have already done that. But what you need to make a commitment to is reprioritizing what it means to be a giver. Not just to spend an extra thousand dollars in debt this month. Not just to seem generous by checking off a lift and passing around coffee mugs that you got. Look, I got 40 of these for two dollars at a garage sale. I'm going to give them away for Christmas next year. I mean, we, we like, like squirrels, we start hoarding, you know, like nine months in advance because we're just trying to check all the lists. And that's thoughtful, but is that thoughtfulness a shortcut to meaningfulness? Because the true giving is proximity and presence, and from my heart to your heart, I see the need. And it may not be a physical need, it may not be a financial need, it may just be an emotional need that someone needs to be encouraged, someone needs to be loved, someone needs to be blessed, someone needs to be acknowledged. So I want you to rethink what it means to give. And give more. Give more. As we close today, we're going to do a couple things. One, the band's going to come out. We're going to play a song. We're just going to worship. We're going to say, Holy Spirit of God, stir up this fire in me to give the way that you give. To not mail it in. To not be stuck in my own traditions. But to recapture what it means to give. If you're here today and you've never exchanged your life for life in Christ, to pray in faith that you would give your life to Jesus so that his life would be yours, to accept and receive the forgiveness that only he can give. And your seat back in front of you is a next step card. You can fill that out. Under each cross, if you want to pray with someone, whatever your need may be, our prayer teams will be available. But the ushers are going to come. We're going to pass the offering, and we're going to worship and allow this message just to sink in and respond to the Holy Spirit as he moves. So ushers, if you would, come at this time. Prayer team, if you would, come at this time. And then I want to invite you to stand as we sing and worship together.